Ladies and gentlemen, record geeks, retired plate spinners, and millennials who want to impress their parents with their record collections. Welcome to the Rhino Cast Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Get ready for new releases, deep tracks, and conversations with your favorite artists and bands, and balloons for the kiddies. And now, your hosts with the most, Rich Mahan and Dennis the Menace. Coming up on this RhinoCast, special guest, musician, and producer Ricky Phillips gives us the inside story of 10 by 10 It's the last album conceived by the legendary Ronnie Montrose and finished by some of his closest musician friends. Here we go! Loose from the ball and chain Out from under the whipping cane Only got myself to blame mm. Walk away if it's not your fight This pertains to the civil rights But I must admit it's a shame Hey, Rich. Hey, Dennis. Well, it's time for another RhinoCast. As a guitarist yourself, I know you're super excited about today's featured release. Yeah, no kidding. Rhino has just released the last album by legendary guitarist Ronnie Montrose entitled 10 by 10 It was conceived before Ronnie passed as a passion project with bassist Ricky Phillips, who currently plays with Styx and was also in Bad English, and drummer Eric Singer, who's played with Kiss and Alice Cooper. They finished the album as the ultimate tribute, and the guest vocalists and musicians would have made Ronnie proud. Yeah, there's some great pairings on this record. Check this out. Deep Purple Singer, Glenn Hughes... Does a song with Def Leppard guitarist Phil Collin, Sammy Hagar and Toto guitarist Steve Lukather pair up, Joe Bonamassa plays with Ricky Phillips on a track, and Edgar Winter and Tommy Shaw from Styx are on another track. We got to talk about the album with none other than Ricky Phillips from his studio in Austin, Texas. Let's get into the conversation right now with Ricky Phillips about Montrose 10 by 10 on the RhinoCast. Ricky... Tell us about 10 by 10 and give us a little bit of background about how you hooked up with Ronnie and how the record started coming together. Yeah, Ronnie and Eric Singer and myself started working together in, I think it was 2001, and we did mostly the band Montrose material with Ronnie. He'd kind of come full circle from producing jazz artists and going from rock and roll to doing acoustic albums. He did all kinds of things. He's the kind of guy that never really wanted to repeat himself. Which is maybe one of the reasons that he isn't just an absolute icon in the guitar world. He's, he's loved and well-known by players, especially, and he does have his legion of fans. But Eric Singer and I have talked often about why Ronnie Montrose wasn't bigger, because the very first Montrose record was certainly required reading for all rock and roll personnel all players and engineers and anybody you know who really got it. So we were fans, and, and he and I would move our schedules around to be able to work with Ronnie as much as we could. And we got to the point where it just was such a good vibe. And Ronnie was always about the power trio. And he would, you know, he would say things like, you know, at the core of any great band is a really happening power trio. And once you got that tight and you go in and record that, anything else you put on top of it's going to be great. And he felt, I think, for the first time in a while that the three of us had something that he really wanted to get down. And we did too. I mean, we were frothing at the mouth to, to record with Ronnie, and, and so we went into a place that I'd been producing stuff that had a two-inch machine. It was a Stevens machine, the same machine that recorded the wall on, and I, I think the Rumors record was actually mixed on this machine. 
and a guy named Doug Messenger owns the room, and it's great little hot rotted console, and and I really was always happy with the way things sounded, very analog coming out of that place. So Ronnie went in and fell in love with the place too, and we started just carving tracks. The way Ronnie works is really kind of cool because it goes back. He's always refers to old school, and he wanted to get us somewhat unrehearsed, but we had song ideas, although we came up with two or three probably there in the studio. He had some pieces he'd been putting together, and we would jam on these ideas. We'd kind of work out arrangements. Ronnie would say, okay, just follow me. I'll signal the changes. And we would slam something down, and he'd say, great, that sounded great, we're moving on. You know, if I wanted to punch in something, Ronnie would go, no, 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 that's what you played. That's that's it. That that's that's great. And he didn't believe in click tracks. He thought music should breathe and he would make, you know, statements like, you know, I got news for you folks, you know, musicians aren't perfect, they're human beings. He really liked and as I said, referred to old school, he really liked things to come together and be a little bit unfinished until that sort of nervous energy creates something cool in the studio. And that's what we did. And we did ten songs that way. There's three songs on the record. One of them is Strong Enough. He had an idea for sort of a swampy, just kind of crazy guitar riff. And Eric immediately started playing this backbeat groove that, and I don't even think I play bass on the one, which, you know, if you count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, so I'm one and, one and. And that's where the beat started and, and finished. The, we just came up with this kooky sort of track. Ronnie came to me and said, do you think Tommy Shaw would want to attack this one? It took Tommy in about three and a half hours, I think, that he and I worked on writing the lyric and the melody and actually recording his guitar parts and vocal. It just happened really quickly. Are you strong enough to be my brother? I should backtrack just a little bit because what we were always trying to find a lead singer. We were trying to find somebody who could sing this material. And nobody could really cover it all. Ronnie called me one day and said, I have an idea. I want to run this by you. Our 10 songs, 10 tracks, finished as they are with 10 different singers. In between Eric and I, the joke was always great. Ronnie, that's an awesome idea, but we can't even find one singer. How are we gonna find 10 singers? That's when he explained, no, I wanna call Sammy, I wanna call Edgar, Greg Raleigh. Most people may or may not know he was in Santana, sang Black Magic Woman, all those big hits, and then started Journey with, with Neil Sean. Um, there are a lot of San Francisco, or, or at least Bay Area, Northern California people on this record. Ronnie was from Colorado, but he transplanted himself into Northern California, and that's where things started happening for him. And he had a real love for the musicians in that area, and, and they were family. So this whole project started with wanting to be a power trio, and when he called Edgar, everything changed. <laughs> because Edgar has such a large bag of tricks and you don't want to say no to any of them. So he plays sax on the track. He, he plays incredible B3, Hammond B3 organ on the track. And then he stacks his own vocals and the things just started to go in a direction where, where the palette opened up and it wasn't just simply a power trio with vocals on it. Had we found some guy that was a real power vocal singer like Glenn Hughes or something, maybe we would have gone that way. Really, it was Edgar who, who opened the door, and I'm glad he did. So far, so bad, you are driving me mad. What's so low, what's so high, you know I can't deny.
when I took the project over, my inclinations, I knew what Ronnie wanted, and I did, with great attention to detail, follow what blueprint he'd already started with this 10 by 10 project. But I do have my own production chops, which I felt to really do it the best I can. I can go so far with him and his ideas. And then there were things that opened up. I love background vocal arrangements. I do like juxtaposing really heavy slamming rock guitars with some keyboard textures to pivot off of. It makes the guitars even seem heavier. But I did stay with Ronnie's overall concept. And I've been asked whether that was difficult or not. It actually, I think, made it easier because there were times when, in production, you'll find things that are working and you'll find things that were, seem to just happen. Who knows? No, not much thought was put into it. It sounds fantastic. Then there's songs that you can't figure out what is missing here. And I would always think, well, what would Ronnie do? And boom, that would pretty much solve the problem almost 99% of the time. This is not a tribute record. These are the last recordings of Ronnie Montrose. He's on every song, and 90% of the guitars on the record are Ronnie. It's that other 10% are the, the, the guys that came in to put down solos. This insight that Ronnie had in creating moods and creating these tapestries that are in these songs made it so much fun to bring people in that I knew Ronnie respected to help finish one thing that's very notable on a lot of these tracks are these female vocals. And I'm curious about how much of that was in the original vision and how much of that was brought to the project. Well, you, you just picked on the one point that was me and not Ronnie. And that's amazing. But I always, Ronnie and I always really liked Humble Pie. We liked Steve Marriott a lot. And we liked the way Steve Stevie Marriott used the female background vocal against a screaming male rock singer. My sort of production chops in that regard, since we're talking about it, is I like to do one step further, and that is I get a couple ladies who can just, they're soulful and, and they can get gospel or they can get rock. Then I put a guy, and in this case, uh, Jeff Scott Soto's the guy I put in here. He's got a nice, thick, throaty, amazing voice. And with the girls, we had this solid foundation. I jumped in on two or three of the songs. Ronnie and I both had that love for that thing, but we never really discussed it being on this record. I just knew that he'd be welcome to it. The, the balance of what will make this a revelation for Montrose fans is that it retains the integrity of what he did and what he specialized in. It also is this, like you said, it's not a tribute. It is a vision realized. Mm. So do you ever think about if he was sitting next to you <laughs> or was looking over your shoulder as you were mixing this record, mm -hmm. some of the things he would whisper in your ear? I almost feel as though he did at times. Not to get all spooky, but there would be times where I'd be in my studio, it'd be two, three in the morning, and I'm working on something or a placement of something doesn't seem quite right, or I just played a... Uh, I, I did a considerable amount of Hammond B3 work on this record myself. I'd be doing, say, a keyboard part, or maybe an overdub acoustic guitar part, or um, the kind of things that you do in the studio that kind of put that little sparkle on, on top of tracks, the things that take some time to figure out. You don't want to fill in all the holes, or all of it, it's just a massive wall of sound. And we, we, Ronnie and I had many discussions about how music really needs to breathe. For anything to speak, you got to get it has to have its own room. So it'd be nights like that where all of a sudden some some complete thought would come into my mind, and I'm tired. I've been here for hours, and now all of a sudden I have this moment of complete clarity. And as I'd start working on it, I would pause and go. Ronnie, <laughs> you know, it's, where did that come? <laughs> where did that come from? But that happened several times. So it's funny that you should you should ask the question because it was oh, that's uh, very, cool. very very uh, goosebumps time. Heavy traffic. We'd like to go kind of in depth on two tracks. That being one of them, the other one, Colorblind. So, sure. anything that you can remember about how Ronnie would talk about the song or his vision for the song, and also what it was like for Sammy to come back in and have to reapproach this knowing 
his history with Ronnie. Let's start with heavy traffic. Heavy traffic was Ronnie and I, we wanted the ideas to be unique. But in this one instance on heavy traffic, we were talking about humble pie. And we were talking about other sort of British influenced, maybe not A, A bands, but even B and C bands that we thought were cool, had done some really great stuff. And there, and there comes a reference back to the Power Trio, which Ronnie was so much in love with. So we, we just started riffing and we came up with Heavy Traffic. The majority of the riffs are Ronnie's. Uh, the initial guitar that you hear at the beginning when you hear Eric Martin scream, Ronnie, and then Ra-da. Da, 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 bah. I mean, that's that's Ronnie just playing that slam and slow hand, thick, crisp, clean. You know, it's it's dirty and clean at the same time because you can hear every, every the scrape of every string, but it's still got that grit. Initially, Eric had screamed Ronnie in the middle of the song where Ronnie was going to play the guitar solo, and. Ronnie passed before he could do that guitar solo, so it was always something that was, I knew I was going to have to take care of it, but I didn't know, should I leave it in there, even though it's not going to be Ronnie? And then it hit me, uh, one of those wake up in the middle of the night things, and I said, wait a minute, that scream should be how the record starts, and then it goes into Ronnie slamming that guitar riff down. So, you know, and maybe that was Ronnie's idea and he woke me up in my sleep. I don't know. The bass is just down and dirty and Eric knew immediately what to do on the drums. When Ronnie first came up with the 10 by 10 idea, he was getting frustrated by the fact that I was gone with sticks so much and Kiss was really starting to do a lot more shows again. And so Eric was gone a lot. And he basically said, look, I don't want this to die on the vine. And that's why he came up with the 10 by 10 idea and concept. But I wasn't sure who was going to be doing what track. He told me, he said, man, I think, I really think Eric Martin just nailed this one track. I said, which track? And he goes, the Humble Pie reference track. I said, really? He's got the right voice for it. And then with Janae Fincannon and Debbie Holiday, Eric also does a few of the background vocals. So the three of them are really the background people. It took me a while to figure out the heavy traffic that the girls come in and sing. I tried to sing with Eric and as I would do my little sketches to figure out where the background should go and it was not working. So I realized, wait a minute, it's an answer. And that's, that's when we came up with the hook. When the girls came in and, and the first time they sang it, I went, oh God, there, there we go, we're there. Everybody wants Ronnie used to say that, um, you know, a guitar solo is like sex. You build up to the frenzy, you don't start with the frenzy. And, and I think a lot of guitar players today, uh, and it was one of the things that I addressed with every guitar player on, on the record. I said, listen, this is a Ronnie Manchos record, guys. So think Ronnie Manchos and, that, and the reasons he liked you. Be yourself, but within that, I, I don't want to hear pyrotechnics. I don't want to hear scales. I want to hear emotion. I, w- I want to hear what Ronnie would want to hear. All right, so let's talk about Colorblind, which made it in the top 10 on the classic rock chart recently. Wow. But certainly a track that's gotten a lot of attention off 10 by 10. Yeah, it, it, and, and I can see why. I mean, Ronnie Montrose and Sammy Hagar together were an unstoppable force, and uh, I've been told that that's, you know, Van Halen sort of patterned themselves after that, right down to even using the producer that Montrose used. Sammy and Ronnie were like brothers. I know they fought, it's no secret, but there was such deep love between the two, deep respect. And when you got guys like that that are so talented and, you know, brothers are, can be brothers, but brothers do fight. And I'm just so glad at the end of Ronnie's life that he and Sam were back to being dear, dear friends. And I'm glad that they were at a point where they could work together and do such brilliant work like 
colorblind. Sammy's lyric is unfortunately probably timeless. Sammy delivers the most believable, heartfelt vocal I've, heard, I've, I've personally heard him do. It's a reminder of how good this man is at selling a song, at, at believing in his lyric and, and emoting exactly the way you want to feel. And against this track that, that Ronnie came up with himself, there you go, Montrose and Hagar again. I play both four and eight string basses on that. I play Hammond organ and Eric Singer again on drums. Steve Lukather. <laughs> Steve, I just saw Steve last night, as a matter of fact. I went to see him with Ringo, and uh, we had a great time to just chat for a bit before he did his gig. So proud of him for what he contributed to this song. My engineer on this that I brought in is an incredible guitar player by the name of Bruce Gowdy. Well, Bruce Gowdy and Steve Lukather <laughs> sat together in high school music class. We were just talking about this last night. And uh, they've been dear, dear friends. And I was on the road with Sticks, so I couldn't be there for the session. Steve only had two days off before he, I think he was going back out with Toto. So I set up the session over at Bruce's. I had a little talk with Steve about what I was looking for in light of what I was alluding to with the preference on guitar that, that Ronnie had. Ronnie used to say the thing that he liked about Luke was there's a song that Luke did, it was a Toto song, where a song completely changes when it goes into his solo and it becomes almost thematic, like movie thematic. That was what Ronnie wanted to hear. He wanted to hear guitar players who spoke and shared an emotion with what they were playing. That's exactly what Luke gave us on this song. And uh, it, it's so appropriate and so perfect because it's such deep su subject matter. It's almost like My Guitar Gently Weeps. The notes just seem to, to take you on, you could close your eyes and, and just go on a little journey while, while Luke's playing. Hey! This younger generation, whatever letter we want to put, X, Y, Z, it doesn't matter what they are. Mm -hmm. When they listen to a recording like this, that obviously is based, as you described, in mostly probably 60s and 70s rock and roll, what would you like them to take away from it that as they move forward, whether they become musicians or engineers or whatever, but in their appreciation of music, which is infinitely different the way they take it in the attention span all of that and not obviously seeing it live which is kind of the basis for them these days mm -hmm. what would you like them and what do you think ronnie will put it on both of you to take away from this project that's a very difficult question to maybe answer without it just personalizing it because everybody's got their opinion but i i listen to this record and i hear the experience everybody's job on this record to make sure that ronnie montrose was heard his last recordings on this earth came to fruition and, and we're, we're out there for people to listen to yeah there's that but beyond that there's the playing in certain cases reservation and not playing being able to see where you fit on a palette that's already got other guys on it and you've been asked to come in and do something special find out where what you can do what colors may be missing i would really encourage young players to listen and study this record there is so much to learn from less is sometimes more but this record has a lot of examples of different kinds of influences I feel like every one of these tracks, they belong together, but there's a difference in each of them. Do you remember Ronnie's last words as related to this project? 
Yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, it was about three weeks before Ronnie passed, he told me how much he loved this record and that how much he wanted to finish it. He said, I finally feel like I'm ready to finish this record. My chops are back. One little side note I will share is that Ronnie didn't play guitar for a couple years. He had cancer. He went through that battle. He won that battle. During that downtime, he didn't pick up a guitar. So when he got through that fight, he started to play a guitar again privately and worked and worked and worked. And um, he was finally good to go. So it was a shock to me and a lot of other people when uh, we, f we found out that Ronnie had passed. You know, he was an interesting, amazing, funny, loved by so many people. A lot of us thought we were his best friend. <laughs> and you find out, oh, wait a minute, you know, Ronnie was just real with everybody. So he got close to everybody he knew. He was the real deal, you know, all the way down from being the amazing guitar player was to being an amazing friend. Howdy, buckaroos. Circle the wagons and sound the alarm. It's time for the Rhino Roundup. Hi there, it's Lauren G. And John Hughes from Rhino, and this is the Rhino Roundup. We've got a good one for any alt-country fans. We've got deluxe editions of Wilco's AM and Being There, featuring the original albums expanded with rare and unreleased recordings that have never been heard before. Hmm. Yeah, the AM Deluxe Edition includes the original album plus eight unreleased bonus tracks. It's available on CD and double LP, and Being There Deluxe Edition features loads of never-before-heard songs, alternate takes, and live performances. Available as a five CD collection or a four LP set. If you're interested, you can get it at wilcoworld.net. They've got exclusive colored vinyl, limited to 2,500 copies of each. Oh, better move quick on that one. Yeah. Now, speaking of deluxe, it does not get any more deluxe than the Smiths, The Queen is Dead Deluxe Edition that's out now. Several formats. Probably the most deluxe of these formats is the three CD, one DVD box set, which has a new remaster of the album, additional recordings with demos, B-sides, alternative versions, plus live in Boston, recorded at the Great Wood Center for the Performing Arts back in 1986. And the DVD features the 2017 remaster of the album in high res, plus the Queen is Dead film that Derek Charman had done for the band back in the day. There's also a slimmer two CD version if you just want the music, and this beautiful five LP box set that has all the audio, including the live in Boston recording. And it's such a seminal record, it's 30 years old. It's really exciting to be able to dive into the Smiths catalog in this format for the first time for us. And it is just the first of many. Top of my list for sure. I'm down. That's the Rhino Roundup. Thanks very much for tuning in to the RhinoCast. We appreciate you spending your time with us. We're almost done, Rich, but not quite. There's one more rather important thing we need to cover. That's right. If you liked what you heard today and you want to know more, please come on over to rhino.com and check it out. You can go to your favorite download site to buy it. If you want to listen first, go to your favorite streaming site. Or if neither of those is your speed, hit your local record retailer and pick up the wax. Doesn't matter if you're 33 and a third or 45, it all works. Peace and love, people. Be good to each other. And last but certainly not least, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next RhinoCast. Executive producers for Rhino, John Hughes and Lauren Goldberg. Produced for Rhino by Pop Cult and Rich Mayhan Promotions. All rights reserved.